All right, everybody. So we've seen the uh, the Greece kind of rise up. We're seeing Greece fall apart. And we're going to see how Greece truly does fall. Uh, we're talking about the idea of Hellenistic Greece, kind of where the area of Greece that um, uh, where it falls from its classical form to the last little piece of Greece, uh, led by the idea of Alexander the Great. I took this uh, part of PowerPoint that from Susan M. Poher from New York. She did a great PowerPoint. I kind of added some stuff to it here. Let's talk about the impacts of that Peloponnesian War. Think about it first off. Athens. No longer a top city anymore, okay? It is, uh, you know, Sparta came. They took down the walls, destroyed it. Sparta is a top state, but they fall apart. All these city states have been fighting for this 25 year long war. They're worn down. They're vulnerable. And somebody steps in, okay? And the person who steps in was Philip II of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is uh, north of, is, uh, north of the Greek city states. He was a kingdom that was, that was, you know, rising in power during this time. And he decided to swoop down uh, from the north and take over all his city-states and unite them. He actually was obsessed with classical Greek culture. And he wanted to see a united Greece and kind of bring him back to power. So he did just that. Now, granted, all the city-states did not agree with this. So they actually rebelled sometimes. And he used his big military to put down all the rebellions. Now, the most famous person from Macedonia was probably Alexander. This was Philip, Philip's son. Uh, he was his oldest son. And probably basically received the best education you get at the time. Um, one of his tutors was Aristotle. And he received the best military training, all those kind of things. I mean, this kid was running military units at age 16. Uh, the best fighter, the best horseman, uh, and sometimes the best, you know, most famous person in this time, basically. Okay. And uh, Philip, Philip dies uh, when Alexander is 21 years old. Um, we think Philip is killed. He's actually killed by one of his bodyguards. I think maybe he could have been assassinated. One of the rumors that goes wrong with this is that uh, uh, Philip II had just remarried. He had remarried a, a, a woman who was a lot younger than his first wife. And in, in their culture, they could have more than one wife. And so he started spending all his time with his new wife. Now, his uh, first wife and oldest wife was Alexander's mother. And she, I, the rumor is, the historical conspiracy theory kind of thing is that she kind of started freaking out about this whole deal and afraid that Alexander might lose a chance to become king if he fathered a child with his new wife. So the rumor is that she had him killed so Alexander could become king. As I said, once again, kind of a big conspiracy theory here. But anyway, Alexander the Great becomes, you know, king at age 21. Here we got the images of Alexander the Great here, the statues, the young guy, always shown as being really, really buff, all those kind of things. And he kind of would have been this, you know, this great... Uh, supposedly this great leader, a guy who uh, kind of knew how to do everything right and could do no wrong. He just portrayed wearing military armor because he was a military man. And so we see how he starts building an empire. The first thing is he builds an army. Instead of just using the Greek phalanx, that big uh, mass of soldiers, that big rectangular formation, he combines it with cavalry. So he takes the idea of, of, of the phalanx and combines it with horse-mounted soldiers who would ride in and fight. And so he's using the two parts together to his advantage. Now, his cavalry group was called the Companion, Companion Cavalry. And it was honestly Alexander's closest friends who fought with him. And so Alexander sets his sights on the biggest empire out there, that being the Empire of Persia. Now, uh, Persia's new leader is Darius III. And so uh, uh, Alexander fights against Darius. And they fight a lot of large battles regarding uh, kind of back and forth, and I'm not going to make you memorize battles, that kind of stuff. Um, but there are different times when Alexander's army, even though it's a lot smaller than uh, than uh, than Persia's army, uh, defeats the Persian army. And actually, some of the Persians quit the Persian army and join Alexander. Um, it, in fact, what's kind of funny is that uh, over a 13-year period of fighting, Alexander captures almost the entire area of of well, the known world, uh, Persia, Egypt, and all the way up to India uh, in a 13-year period. Um, one of the most famous battles is the last battle he fights against the Persians, where supposedly King Darius III is running away in his chariot and um, you know just runs away from the battlefield since his, since his group is, is losing. Now, finally, with Alexander, that Alexander was also a very humble leader, and he actually treated the, uh, the uh, defeated uh, leaders with respect. Um, Darius III is actually killed by his own bodyguard and left to lie in a ditch. And when Alexander finds his body, he actually has a formal burial for him. So it's kind of one of those unique things you see from this leader. But you kind of see his whole list of, of, uh, of his, of his conquests. He starts here, goes to the ancient of Troy, all the way through 
Turkey, down here to uh, Egypt, this way up to Syria, to Persia, Persian capital, all the way up here to India, to the Hindu Kush mountains, to the, in to the area of India where he stops. Uh, this battle here called Gagamela, and Gagamela played that famous battle where he defeats the Persian army and sends their sort of running. Uh, when he gets down to Egypt here, he's actually seen as a king uh, because, you know, you know, the, the Pharaoh, when we crown the Pharaoh of Egypt, he's considered to be the same as, as, as a god at that, at that time. So he's considered to be a god as well there. Now, he stops over here, okay, uh, at uh, India. He's basically stopped at that, at that point. And the reason he stopped because his guys are tired. Uh, his men are tired. They've been fighting for 13 years. They started over here in Greece. And you kind of see the images of, of, of uh, Alexander the Great fighting here. Um, and he basically creates the largest empire known to map at that time. And he builds his new cities and calls them all Alexandria after himself. You can see here's Alexandria in Egypt. There's more Alexandria spread across uh, all different areas. The, large, the, the farthest Alexandria being in modern day Afghanistan over here, which still so exists today actually. Um, and he basically gets encouraged the different Greek Macedonians to settle in all the different cities that are there. And when he finally gets to the idea of India, guys are not very happy, okay? Um, you know, soldiers are, they've been fighting for 13 years, they've been injured, they've been hurt, they miss home, so he starts sending guys home. Some of the soldiers also were kind of getting unhappy about, you know, what Alexander's doing. Um, he starts acting more Persian. One of the things he did was he started acting, he started, you know, acting, kind of taking on the culture of the areas he took over. So he would dress like a Persian, he would, he actually married one of Darius III's daughters to kind of unite uh, the empires, uh, he, he would learn how to speak Persian. He actually encouraged his soldiers to marry Persian girls uh, so they could, you know, be part of the culture there. And some people didn't like it. Some people thought that was going a, just a step too far in terms of how he was acting like a Persian. Well, eventually, uh, one night, uh, Alexander dies. Uh, all of a sudden, he gets sick all of a sudden. Uh, he gets a really high fever and passes away. Some people think he may have been poisoned. Other people think he may have just picked up some disease, random disease that was going around. Uh, but they actually divide his empire among his generals. He looks at that in a second, with empire is. We can't see all the different new cities that were constructed. And these are all the new cities that Alexander built uh, throughout his empire. Notice how a lot of them are called Alexander, Alexandria, right here. There's one here, one here, okay, all over the place. And the impact of his empire is that he starts connecting all these different cultures together. Look at how the, the area of the cities are being built here. He starts connecting all these different cultures. He connects the Greeks to the Egyptians, to the Persians, to Indians. And all these different groups are kind of starting to get connected. And basically allows for this flow of beliefs between these different places. Um, religion, language, all that kind of stuff starts flowing back and forth. Uh, you can see this in some of the cities he built. Here's a city called Pergamum. Uh, it was a, called a Hellenistic city. Hellenistic means the spread of this Greek culture among different places. This is a city in the Middle East. Notice you have the same Greek amphitheaters we looked at in class. Uh, on Wednesday in your textbook, we have... The Greek columns you see here we looked at in class on Wednesday. All these kind of things are put here into these different cities, just like that. You also see ideas of mathematics. The Greek alphabet starts transferring back and forth. The numbers we get from India. All these ideas start transferring back and forth, including food and everything else. Here's the idea of how it happens all through the idea of trade. You start seeing how all these different things are being traded back and forth. It can be horses, silk. Goods, all this kind of thing is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between all these different places uh, in his empire. And with those, with, with that uh, trade, goes the ideas of language, goes religions, all that kind of stuff. The Greek religions flowing this way, the Persian religion flowing back that way, Egyptian gods and goddesses mixing and matching with things in Egypt, all this kind of, all, in Greece, all these kind of ideas are kind of. Uh, coming together through the idea of trade, this big linked up empire, it's all linked together by a system of roads and trade routes. Um, we also see him kind of start collecting different pieces. He builds a library at Alexandria, uh, which is basically to house all the world's knowledge. All the great Greek thinkers, all the scrolls are placed in this big um, library at Alexandria. It's basically be the world's uh, main center, main center to keep knowledge. And so we start seeing all this knowledge, kind of these scrolls being stored here to keep all the knowledge and writing from guys like Socrates and Ptolemy and, and uh, all the different scientific guys that we have uh, in, in philosophy. All these things are being written down and placed into this library, Library Alexandria. You see artwork change. Here's kind of that Hellenic, is uh, basically Greek art, if you will. 
here's a Hellenistic art. You kind of start seeing it change a little bit. There's more emotion to it, more realism to the artwork that we have here. Um, those just look a little more real in terms of expression. And so we start seeing the artwork kind of shift and change a little bit because of this change of culture as well. We also start seeing different philosophies develop. And one of the famous, uh, uh, there are three big philosophies develop, and I have to kind of summarize each one of your notes here. One of the cynics. Okay. A cynic would basically ignore social convention and avoid luxury. He about the idea of, you know, we're all supposed to be in this kind of together idea that we just kind of live the life we want to live. The idea of being a cynic was you kind of ignore what you're supposed to do, okay? And you basically live a very simple, humble life. You live a basic life that, you know, other people think, oh, you got to live rich and live awesomely, that kind of stuff. Well, you say you live a really simple, humble life and just kind of ignore the regular social conventions that are out there. A guy named Epicurus taught the idea of Epicureanism, where basically you try to just try to have fun in your entire life, try to seek pleasure for what makes you happy. All your your goal is just to try to avoid pain, avoid problems, and try to find what makes you happy in that end. And part of the idea was that, you know, almost like the Buddha, if you will, a little bit, that excesses and, and wanting led to pain. And so he says, you know, just seek pleasure and have fun, enjoy life. Um, also, that politics should be avoided because politics tends to lead to wanting excess power and less pain. The most famous, my favorite one, is actually the idea of being a Stoic. Uh, a guy named Zeno wrote this, Zeno wrote this up. And basically, it says that um, nature is the expansion of divine will. Basically, there's a divine will out there that's going to direct you where you got to go. Um, and that is this idea, of, big idea of natural law governs every single person out there. That you should get into politics, try to help each other out, but you don't do it for personal gain. Um, you basically try to help work for the good of all instead of good of, you know, you. And you basically don't let things bother you is a big part of it. Um, every time being, being stoic, it's just rolling with the punches and you kind of keep things going the way it goes. You don't get all hyped up because something happens. You, you just explain, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. We'll move on from there. Uh, and then you kind of get involved in things to help the better good versus make yourself look better. Your whole goal is to help others versus just help you. And that true happiness is found making great achievements, which you only get by rolling with the punches and working for uh, the betterment of things. As where Alexander dies here, you have he has this huge empire. And here's the known world of time. You gotta think, looking at empire, at Alexander's empire, which I'm kind of tracing around right here right now. Uh, he basically owned almost the entire known world when you think about it, and he basically owned everything. Notice how it has Northern Ocean, that kind of stuff on here. Um, this is actually what they thought the map looked like at the time. And they thought this was the actual world. We have ancient names like Cinnamon Land, that kind of stuff on here. Um, you can kind of see those are the names that are on uh, this uh, this map here. But this is actually what they thought the world looked like in the 3rd century BC, in the 200s, on the time Alexander Falls. And so you kind of see just how small is the world is at this point. That's what I talk real quick for the last minute here are some ideas that come out of uh, Hellenistic ideas, new scientific kind of stuff. And one is the idea of how the, how the, how the universe looks. You have uh, Aristarchus and you have Ptolemy, who both talked about uh, the idea of where the sun is. So uh, Aristarchus was about Hellenist, uh, the heliocentric theory, sun being the center of everything. Ptolemy was geocentric theory. Uh, we talked about how, you know, uh, Arabata in India had the same kind of ideas. Now, in here, uh, Ptolemy becomes the main uh, person. I'm going to flip back to it in a second here, but here's Ptolemy's idea. And he kind of talked about how here's here's the Earth, there's the Moon, there's the Sun. And this is kind of what uh, Ptolemy said the, the whole solar system looked like. And he said this is what it was. And that uh, this is how things look like. And this is actually the the belief that was followed up through, my gosh, the uh, the 1400s is how this looked actually in uh, in Europe as well. You have Euclid. Uh, if you have done any kind of geometry uh, in, in math class, you've looked at Euclid before. Euclid did planar geometry. And it's all the graphing and those kind of things all come from Euclid. Also, you have Archimedes, who was a great inventor, looked at things like the pulley. Uh, so, how do you know, raise and lower things using pulleys to uh, have less weight on, on less, less work? The idea of the screw. I think I've ever screwed something in. He invented the idea of a screw as a pump to pump water out of mines. There was a famous guy who looked at the idea of displacement, that when you have a bathtub of water and you throw a bowling ball in, the water rises up. He did that by jumping into a bathtub yelling, Eureka, I found it, figured out how to get water out of different places. So all these different ideas and sciences come out of this time here as well. Um, obviously, Alexander ends. Uh, his generals fight for control of the empire. Here's what it looks like at the end after his generals uh, try to take over. 
and we see a split then leading to the rise of Rome.